Hey guys, Miss Literal, we are on chapter 27 of Zoo Break. The zoo was such a daytime place that it seemed eerie and threatening in the gloom. The team wheeled through the acres of empty parking lot, illuminated only by the faintest of lights. The ticket windows were shuttered, the front gate barred by a rolling section of fence. Pitch hopped off the roller bushel, scaled the barrier with ease. Piece of cake she called softly. It's just a latch. Griffin helped her slide the heavy fencing aside and six Rolo bushel vehicles entered the zoo. From here, Savannah took the lead role in the operation. Not only was she the animal expert, but she had been here after hours and Dr. Alfred had given her an insider's view. There are zookeepers on call, but not on site, she whispered. The only people at the zoo right now are two night watchmen cruising around in golf carts. If we stay off the main path, we should be able to avoid them. The Rolo bushels were designed to drive in orchards, Griffin added. We can take them across the grass. Melissa spoke up. Where's the computer that controls the locked cages? That's in the administration building, Savannah replied, just past the food court. The procession of roller bushels drove off the pavement into the cover of the trees. They skirted the compound, their vehicles bumping over stones and roots. The ride was rougher, but the suspension was rock steady. The bags with their live cargo did not fall off. Their course took them behind some of the zoo's most famous exhibits. Griffin could make out the tall shape of the sleeping giraffe silhouetted against the moonlit sky. Further along, there were two large hulks, probably the rounded backs of the elephants. But this was no sightseeing tour. He couldn't let his mind wander now that their goal was so close at hand. He focused all of his attention on keeping his scooter right behind Savannah's and making sure that the others were close behind him. Administration read the sign in front of a low building constructed in the shape of an L. It lay flat to the ground, its front door protected by one simple padlock. Griffin stopped his roll of bushel and hopped off the platform and approached the entrance. From the side pouch of his backpack, he produced the wire cutters he used to open the cages in the first zoo break. He clamped the blades around the lock and squeezed. No progress. Pitch came to lend her strength to the task and two of them groaned with effort. Still nothing. Savannah was now alarmed. If we can't get into the office, we'll never be able to turn off the electronic locks. You mean we came all this way for nothing? Logan said aghast. No way I'm taking this beaver back to my basement. Griffin abandoned the wire cutters. Any good plan always includes a backup. He reached into the pouch once more and pulled out a small hacksaw. This will take a few minutes, so stash the roller bushels in the bushes just in case the security guards come by. He went to work on the padlock sawing vigorously. It was slow going and soon he was bathed in sweat despite the cool night. The metal gave way bit by bit, the shavings raining down on the stoop. Finally, the lock clattered to the pavement. They were in. Griffin, Savannah, and Melissa entered leaving the others to guard the animals. Inside the building, this could have been the main office at their school, with desks and cubicles and a small meeting room down the hallway. Okay, Griffin said all business. Which computer unlocks the cages? They all will, Melissa said. This system has to be run on a secure intranet. Any network station should do the job. We'll use the one in Dr. Alfred's office, Savannah decided. She definitely has the authority. She led them down the corridor to a door marked curator. The door was ajar and the computer was still humming. Melissa sat down and began to pound on the keyboard. Do you think she can do it? Savannah wondered, her eyes full of anxiety. I don't know, Griffin replied, but on a computer, if Melissa can't do it, it simply can't be done. They stood in silence as the keyboard clattered and the data flashed across the screen. The tension was so dense that it was almost visible in the room. The weight of this whole affair was especially heavy on Savannah. 
since the theft of her monkey had set all of this in motion. And as for Griffin, he knew that no hacksaw could save a plan if they couldn't access the cages. Worse than that, there was no going back. Not to Savannah's shed, not to Logan's basement, not to Melissa's closet, not to Pitch's garage, Ben's sauna, or Griffin's Lego drawer. Melissa's quiet voice startled both of them. Okay, she said. Which cage do you want me to open first? The judge's gavel came down like a pistol shot. I sentence you to 50 years in juvenile detention. No! cried Darren, devastated. I'm innocent! He wheeled in the courtroom to face Mr. Natiz, who was laughing so loudly sitting in the front row, claws at his side. You know I'm innocent! You know I'm innocent! You should have thought of that before sending us on a wild goose chase to the Long Island Zoo, Mr. Natiz jeered. It's all Bing's fault. It's all Bing's fault, Darren babbled. He and Slavic, they set me up. They dropped that fake plan out the window because they saw me spying on the house. Bailiff, bailiff, thundered the judge. Take him away. Darren tried his best to escape, but strong hands grabbed him, shaking him. Let me go, let me go, let me go. Darren, Darren, wake up. You're having a nightmare. Shocked, Darren opened his eyes. The arms that held him tightly were his mother's. His father was by the light switch, looking worried. His relief that the 50-year sentence had only been a dream evaporated when his mother asked, You were spying on what house? Um, uh, um, um, uh, I don't know. It was just a dream. I don't even remember what it was about. Darren, you were babbling about Griffin and Ben? his mother informed him, and you kept saying that you were innocent. And I know you, Darren Vader, you are never innocent. What are you mixed up in this time? He was either too sleepy or too rattled to think up a good lie. So he blurted out the whole ugly truth. His father was horrified. Darren? Are you telling me that six kids are on their way to the zoo at 1.30 in the morning and you sent two thugs after them? It sounded bad even to Darren. I had no choice. They were going to call the cops on me because I had a hot owl. Mrs. Vader cast her husband a stricken look. We have to call those other kids' parents and the police. Griffin and Ben parked the roller bushels in the shadows behind the small mammal house. Ben unloaded the pet carrier containing the rabbits and the laundry bag with the prairie dog. Griffin hefted the drawstring sack where his meerkat lay sleeping. Team one, team one to base, he said into his walkie-talkie. Melissa were at the small mammals. Pop the door, please. Got it, Melissa's voice said. Hope this works. They stood there barely daring to breathe and almost broke into wild celebration when they heard a loud click. Griffin reached for the handle and pulled the door wide open. We're in. Logan's voice came over the speaker from the base. Tell me when the beaver's gone. The beaver's with team two at the North American wetlands, Griffin said briskly. Savannah pitched, dumping him in with the duck and the loon. They found themselves in a long corridor with grassed habitats on both sides. Most of the animals were asleep and all of the displays dark. The main hallway was in night mode bathed in a reddish light. Ben radiated anxiety. How do we get them into the habitats? If we break the glass, we'll have the whole zoo on our necks. On the other side of the grounds at the North American wetlands, Savannah overheard them on her own walkie talkie. There's a hallway in the back that lets you get to the display, she advised. Look for an entrance that's marked staff only. Got it, Griffin confirmed. It's locked, Melissa. Hang on. A moment later, again, there was a telltale click. Ben pushed the door open and they hustled the bags inside. This hallway was a thin passage that extended the full length of the building behind the rows of habitats. 
They could not see into the displays, but each one had an access panel that was clearly marked. It identified all the animals inside, their food and water requirements, and the maintenance instructions. Griffin went along reading the signs. Here, the eastern cottontail rabbit, he opened the panel just a crack and they peered inside. There in the middle of the tall grass and pebbly sand of the habitat slumbered two little gray brown bunnies of fur. Ben's was, ben was dismayed. Our guys are white. We got the wrong rabbits. They'll do, Griffin decided. Savannah said it doesn't have to be a perfect match. They just have to avoid killing each other before the zoo people notice them in the morning. They took the three rabbits out of the carrier and gently placed them in the habitat. And the new arrivals, their sleep disturbed, looked around with bleary eyes, but soon everyone settled down. If they were agitated by the move, it didn't show. Griffin felt a faint stirring of hope. The first animals have been unloaded. This could work. This would work. A few displays down, they deposited the prairie dog into a dusty enclosure with tumbleweeds and two other of his species. Switching to the other side of the hall, they located the meerkat exhibit. The heat was cranked up so high that it baked the moisture right out of their eyes as they placed the former tenant of Mrs. Bing's greenhouse into his own natural habitat. You know, Griffin said in a subdued voice, I'm really gonna miss the little guy. I know it sounds crazy, but sometimes I felt like he was the only one who really understood me. You're right, Ben told him. It sounds totally crazy. That left ferret face. In the very last enclosure, they found a community that included a black-footed ferret, two slots, and a European polecat and a weasel. Ben reached into his hoodie and pulled out ferret face. Okay, little buddy, this is your stop. It was one thing to find a home for ferret face. It was quite another to make him go into it. It took every ounce of strength the two had to disconnect the ferret's claws from his fleece hoodie. Even then, the little creature tried to wrestle his way out of Ben's hands, wiggling and spitting. He was just a few inches from the opening when suddenly he froze, his eyes fixed inside the display. There, looking at him, displaying similar markings, was another ferret, a little larger, but otherwise identical. Seizing the moment, Ben placed Ferret Face into the grass and the two new friends scurried off together. Ben stared after them for a long moment. They're growing up so fast, he commented, half joking. Melissa was speaking to Griffin over the walkie-talkie once more. Team one, we're all done here. Next stop, Rodent World. They let themselves out of the building and were almost instantly pinpointed with the approaching headlights. Desperately, Griffin grabbed Ben around the shoulders and hurled the two of them off the doorstop and into the bushes. They huddled there, watching in trepidation as the golf cart rattled slowly and the uniformed security guard at its wheel. When he stopped his cart, the front tire was barely a yard from their hiding place. Griffin switched off the walkie-talkie. If the others tried to make contact with him now, the jig would be up. The shiny black boot stepped right in front of his nose. Please, 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 Griffin prayed. Don't look down, don't look down. The guard walked over to the small mammal house and tried the door. In that heart-stopping instant, Griffin realized he had no idea if the electronic lock had reset itself. If the building was open, the guard would know there was something wrong. Locked, locked. He and Ben exchanged a very quiet high five. The guard got back onto the golf cart and drove off. Savannah and Pitch lurked in the shadows waiting for the familiar click that would tell them Melissa had released the Avery door. They entered the huge structure in an open area, landscaped and treed, enclosed by beautiful mesh fencing. It was a bolsterous place by day, but now the birds were merely dozens of dark shapes perched on the branches asleep. This makes no sense at all, complained Pitch. Why would you leave a chicken that can't even fly in an Avery? Because they don't have a hen house here, Savannah replied. At least here, there's plenty of bird seed and no predators. Unless you're a worm, Pitch agreed. 
She opened the laundry bag and the hen emerged with a ponderous gait. The bird let out a slow squawking cluck, as if testing to see if her vocal cords still worked in these strange new surroundings. The sound provoked an instant response from another bag. The fabric began to indolate in Savannah's arms. A split second later, the little piglet exploded out of the drawstring opening and hit the ground scrambling, rushing over to cuddle up next to the hen. I guess Melissa's closet was their first date. I was gonna let him loose in the butterfly exhibit, Savannah said, but there he'd have no one to talk to. You should seek some help, Pitch advised, matter of factly. He'll be fine here till morning, Savannah concluded. She took out her walkie-talkie. Team two, we're done. How are you making out, Griffin? We're finishing up in Rodent World, he replied. We're a little behind schedule. We got hung up by a security guard. We just saw one too, Savannah confirmed. He was headed out toward the monkey house. We'll be done after we go to the reptile center, Griffin promised. Meet you back at base. In Dr. Alfred's office and administration, Melissa set down her walkie-talkie and scrolled through the screens until she found the controls for the reptile and amphibian center. This would be the last drop-off. Operation Zoo Break 2 was almost complete. Logan put a hand on her shoulder. If one of the security guards is out by the monkeys and the other is circling in a golf cart, who are those two guys right there, Melissa? Melissa followed his pointing finger. A pair of dark silhouettes moved across the central path, flashlights bobbing. Logan snatched up the walkie-talkie. Watch it, guys! There may be two extra security guards out there. They didn't look like security guards to Melissa. They looked like a lot of trouble. Have to stop there, guys. I hope you have an amazing day. See you soon.